Thank you. I like a clean screen. Yes. So, thank you very much, everyone, for being here. We are just about to proceed with the third period of the 187th period of sessions of the Inter American Commission of Human Rights. And um, I say good afternoon to all of you. I hope you had a good lunch, but not too much that will send you off to sleep um, because we want you wide awake for this hearing. Um, so uh, this hearing is entitled Human Rights Situation of the Wet'en <laughs> Nation, uh, um, Indigenous Peoples in Canada. And it was requested by the Wet'u Wet'en Nation and Amnesty International. Please forgive me if I pronounce it very badly. My name is Margaret May McCauley, and I'm presently, I'm presently the president of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights and the country rapporteur for the esteemed state of Canada. I am joined in this panel of the commissioners by the first vice president and the rapporteur for the rights of indigenous people, my sister, Commissioner Esmeralda Arosemena de Trotino, and my brother commissioners, Joel Hernandez and Carlos Bernal. And um, also with the exec by the executive secretary, Tanya Renou, and the uh, Assistant Executive Secretary for Monitoring, Maria Claudia Toledo, and the um, Special Rapporteur on Economic, Social, and Cultural, right, Cultural and Environmental Rights, Soledad Garcia Monos, and the Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression, Pedro Vaca, and also by a number of Secretariat, members of the Secretariat of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. This hearing was requested by the, oh, I lost my screen, was requested by, I'm sorry, by the um, organization for the in um, Wet'u Wet'en, indigenous peoples of the province of British Columbia, and as I say, Amnesty International. And I greet you all in including the, our esteemed ambassador of Canada, Hugh Adzet, who is uh, well known to all of us in the commission. Um, we are hoping to complete this hearing in the predicated time. So uh, let me inform you of the distribution of time among all participants. Um, civil society will have 20 minutes as the requesters. The state will have 20 minutes to respond um, to the requesters comments and the Inter-American Commission panel also 20 minutes. Thereon after the, um, the civil society will have 12 minutes to reply, hopefully, if we are in time, to the comments made and the state will also have 12 minutes to reply. And the Inter-American Commission panel, six minutes to close. I should say that I also send our warmest greetings um, to all those here present and to those who are also present online um, watching and witnessing the proceedings. The, uh, let me, for their um, information, just mention the objective. It is for, for, this, for civil society to submit information on the construction, construction of a gas pipeline in ancestral territories of the Wet'u Wet'en indigenous people in violation of the rights of consultation and consent of the ancestral authorities and the criminalization of their opposition to this project. With that, I invite civil society to commence with 
their comments and take the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, distinguished commissioners, uh, Ambassador Adset and uh, anyone else who's joining us uh, this afternoon. Uh, I am joining you from the unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people in Ottawa. And on behalf of our delegation today, I wish to thank the Inter-American Commission for your timely attention to the severe violation of Indigenous rights in Canada. My name is Kati Nivyabandi, and I serve as the Secretary General of Amnesty International Canadian English Speaking Section. And we're here to bring to your attention the criminalization, the harassment, and the surveillance experienced daily by the Wet'suwet'en Nation as they defend their unceded ancestral territory from the construction of the coastal gas links pipeline. Distinguished commissioners, uh, it must be noted that all five Wet'suwet'en clans oppose the pipeline's construction. Nevertheless, this construction is proceeding without the free, prior and informed consent of the nation's hereditary chiefs in violation of what's written law, Canadian law and Canada's international human rights obligations. With me today are four speakers who will share first-hand accounts and analysis on this acute crisis. You will hear from what's written hereditary chief Namox and Slado, wing chief of the Cassia House, Gidmit and Clan, both from the Wet'suwet'en Nation, as well as from Mary Capron and Belisa Guerrero from Amnesty International. And I will now give the floor to Mary Capron, who will start by detailing for you how the violence, surveillance, and criminalization experienced by the Wet'suwet'en Nation infringes on their human rights. Thank you for your attention. Distinguished commissioners, the Wet'suwet'en Nation face acts of violence, surveillance, har and harassment from state authorities, the pipeline company, and the company's private security firm on a daily basis. The Wet'suwet'en have never sold nor surrendered their title to their territory. They are protecting their land against the construction of the coastal gasoline pipeline. If construction is completed, the pipeline will divide Wet'suwet'en territory into two. The Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs are the authorities of the nation according to Wet'suwet'en law and as affirmed by the Supreme Court of Canada's Delgamuk Gasteiwe decision. The hereditary chiefs oppose the construction of the pipeline on behalf of the nation. They proposed an alternate route for the pipeline. However, the company rejected it. The hereditary chiefs made their opposition known to the company and to the government of British Columbia. However, instead of accepting this, the company and the provincial government entered into benefit agreements with the Wet'suwet'en Indian Act ban councils, even though these councils are not the authorities of the Wet'suwet'en nation. The Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs have called for a stop work order on the pipeline and have issued eviction notices to the pipeline company. Nevertheless, pipeline construction is proceeding without the nation's free, prior, and informed consent. Construction of the pipeline seriously degrades what's what in jurisdiction and the nation's control over its territory. In December 2019, the British Columbia Supreme Court granted the pipeline company an injunction. This injunction prevents anyone from blockading the road to stop pipeline construction in what's what in territory. The injunction includes enforcement provisions, meaning that Wet'suwet'en land defenders can be arrested for approaching pipeline construction sites and blockading the road, even though these sites are located on the nation's unceded territory. Operating under the injunction, the governments of Canada and British Columbia and the pipeline company have harassed, forcibly removed, and criminalized Wet'suwet'en land defenders. In three large-scale police raids, over 70 land defenders were arrested and detained. During these raids, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police were equipped with military assault weapons, helicopters, and dog units. They operated together with the pipeline company security to destroy buildings and desecrate ceremonial Indigenous spaces. Arbitrary arrests and detentions of Wet'suwet'en people and land defenders continue on a regular basis, targeting the Gidendem checkpoint. 
In July 2022, the British Columbia government decided to prosecute land offenders with criminal charges for allegedly defying the injunction. Various Wet'suwet'en land offenders will stand trial later this year. They may be incarcerated if found guilty. The Wet'suwet'en have filed a lawsuit against the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, the pipeline company, and its private security for harassment, intimidation, and collusion. We regret that Canada has not signed the American Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. At the same time, while both Canada and British Columbia have passed legislation to implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, this has not benefited the Wet'suwet'en Nation in any significant way. Further, the United Nations Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination has made recommendations to Canada on three separate occasions regarding the situation of the Wet'suwet'en Nation. However, Canada has not responded with any concrete actions that it has taken to remedy the situation. Canada continues to incorrectly interpret the free prior and informed consent principle and the duty to consult. We recall that states must have consent as the objective of consultation. States must also ensure that no decisions directly relating to the rights of Indigenous peoples are taken without their informed consent. I give the floor to Slato. My name is Slato Molly Wickham of the Gidimden clan. I'm a mother of three young children and live on the territory affected by the Coastal Gas Link Pipeline, or CGL. I'm the spokesperson for the Gidimden Checkpoint, which is a reoccupation of an ancient village site. I moved to the territory 12 years ago so I could raise my children according to our laws and way of life on the land. Before Coastal Gas Link started construction, our home was a place where we felt free to be Wet'suwet'en and could deal, heal from generations of genocide. Now it is threatened and we are under threat for simply existing there. Instead of being a safe haven, my home is now surrounded by security cameras and gates and our village site requires 24 hour watch. Since living at Gidim Den Checkpoint in 2018, I have witnessed a specialized unit of police called the Community Industry Response Group, or CURG, erect a detachment on Gidim Den territory, 29 kilometers from the nearest town. I've experienced our home sites destroyed by CGL as CURG threatened arrest to anyone who would intervene. The CURG's unique structure and mandate raise a series of concerns about the protection of Indigenous rights in Canada. Kirk is currently under review by the Canadian Review and Complaints Commission. The exercising of our rights are being treated as threats and emergencies rather, rather than as political issues to negotiate and are delegated to militarized police forces. Often I'm asked if I see any alternatives to the conflicts that have arisen as we uphold our Indigenous laws. And I always say, this is a political issue that must be addressed by the state and not by state-sanctioned militarized police. Instead, Canada has given Kirk $27 million to police us on our own sovereign lands in the past several years. In 2019, weeks after the province adopted UNDRIP, I was arrested and removed from my territory at gunpoint, while snipers initiated lethal overwatch at Gidim Den checkpoint. Our chiefs were denied access to us during the raid and land defenders sustained serious injuries. Our chiefs continued to assert their jurisdiction and uphold our laws, resulting in another raid in 2020, where I was surrounded by Kurg officers in the dark and threatened with arrest while I was eight months pregnant with my youngest child. In 2021, I was occupying a tiny house alongside the road to CGL's proposed drill pad site when we were surrounded by militarized police in green fatigues with assault rifles who were dropped out of helicopters all around us. They cut the internet, trained their snipers on us from behind buildings and heavy machinery, and used an ax and then a chainsaw to illegally break down the door without an arrest or search warrant. After 56 days of upholding our law and defending our sacred headwaters, I stared down the barrel of a semi-automatic weapon while the dog snarled and whined and was once again removed from my territory, spent five days in seven different jail cells in three different towns. Down the hill, our chief's daughter experienced the same use of violence against her and the log cabin that was built for her was burnt to the ground under the watch of Kurg. 
Today, I cannot live at the village site because of the heavy surveillance, threat of violence, and arrest from police, and the harassment of CGL's private security firm, Forsyth. Forsyth is staffed by mostly ex-members of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police or other state agents. Forsyth sits outside of our village site 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and films everyone coming and going. My whereabouts is tracked by Forsyth security at every entrance and exit to our village site. I am deterred and prevented from accessing our sacred and spiritual sites because of my bail conditions from 2021 that say I cannot be anywhere on my territory except to travel on the road to and from my home unless I'm engaged in a cultural activity. This gives police the discretion to determine what our cultural activities are or aren't. If I am traveling on the territory to pick medicines, harvest meat for my family, or simply to stop and let my children use the bathroom, private security is filming me and refuses to leave. It has been years since my children have had the pleasure of celebrating a birthday on their own territory without police presence, surveillance, and harassment of their guests. We cannot harvest, do ceremony, or even gather as community without constant police presence, surveillance, and harassment, and we are denied the ability to monitor the work being done by the pipeline. The police regularly patrol my home, which is nowhere near the pipeline right away. I wake up some mornings and they're sitting in my driveway. Our elders are scared to access the territory and our people fear police repression and criminalization. The police have teamed up with private industry to make it unbearable to live on our territories and practice our way of life. So how will you ensure the safety of indigenous women, youth and children living at our village site and traveling on our territory while we are stalked surveilled and harassed by police and private police forces in remote and isolated parts of our territory. For all of the millions of dollars that Canada is dedicating to the root causes of violence against Indigenous women, we have had the lead investigator of EPANA, the body responsible for investigating murdered and missing women along Highway 16, also known as the Highway of Tears, harass and threaten Wet'suwet'en women with arrest during ceremony. Our women have been threatened with violence by pipeline workers and police on the territory and in our surrounding communities. As Indigenous women, we have to endure the risk of arrest at any time in our homes and on the territory. What steps will you take to lower the risk of violence against Indigenous women who are already surrounded by industrial man camps along the Highway of Tears? while we are further dehumanized by police in front of these same workers when we are arrested and thrown in jail at gunpoint by industry's very own police force. We have endured years of violent raids and removal after generations of genocide. They use these tactics because they are tried and true to repress indigenous people around the world. We feel the repression of our ancestors and our future generations as Canada criminalizes us for defending our sacred way of life and the health of our lands as our ancestors did. What am I supposed to tell my children as I face jail time for living out our laws and securing their futures? And what does that tell the world about Canada? It tells the world that nothing has changed in 150 years of genocide against our people. We will now hear from Chief Namox, Awatsa, Masai. Howdy. Denny's ate you, Saka's ate you, Sky's ate you. I am Chief Namox. I am a hereditary chief. Our nation is governed by the five clans, the Gidimdan, the Gilsehu, the Lixamishu, the Lixilu, and the Tsaiu. Within that are 13 house groups. That is how the land is governed. It is truly democratic. Everybody has a voice. And right from day one, they said no to this proposed project. We govern as a whole. We are the government and decision makers for the entirety of our 22,000 square kilometers of unceded, non-treaty, undefeated lands on behalf of our house members and clans, no matter where they reside. We follow our traditional laws, Anuk Nuaten, our law, our way, as name holders before us have done for thousands of years, long before European contact. We carry on the same duties and customs that they have passed down to us. One of them being 
the boy to man when I was young, they put us out on the territory for several months to learn about the land, to learn about the sacred sites, to learn about the burial sites. And now with this project, they've destroyed it. They tear up our graveyards. Our ancestors are buried out there and British Columbia and Canada simply issue new permits so that they could go over these grave sites as if our people were nothing. We are the decision makers on our lands as proven in the historic Delgamuk Gustave Supreme Court case, which was decided on December 11th, 1997. In this Supreme Court case, we had proven who we are, how we govern and continue to govern our lands. This court case was upheld, proving we are the people who must be consulted on our lands. Since that historic court case, we have also entered into a memorandum of understanding with both the province of British Columbia and the federal government of Canada, reinstating that we continue to be and shall remain the authority on our lands. This document was signed by all parties on May 14, 2020. Even with that, British Columbia and Canada continue to issue illegal permits on our lands, such as with Coastal Gas Lake, TC Energy. They continue to fund destructive projects by giving incentives, tax credits, and subsidies to these very same companies that are bringing violence to our lands. Since the historic court case, what has changed? We went there with full faith in the province of British Columbia and Canada, and they have not shown any faith in upholding those agreements or court case. They have decided arbitrarily to have corporations sign agreements with band elect chiefs and council. It must be noted that band elect systems only have jurisdiction on the reserved lands that they reside on, similar to municipalities who have elected mayors and councils that are elected and replaced on an election rotation. We are hereditary chiefs for life with a solemn and sacred duty to protect our rights and freedoms, access to lands and our culture for all future generations. It must be noted that while we, the hereditary chiefs, were working with both British Columbia and the federal government of Canada in good faith, they were working together to continue their invasions into our lands, arresting and removing our people from our lands. An example of this is while we were planning our next session together, we were notified of more Royal Canadian Mounted Police and their community industry response group, as well as the mercenary forces of the proposed pipeline coming into our lands by air and by land as directed by both levels of government. Violations to our human rights continue I myself have been threatened with arrest for simply trying to be on our lands. Each time I go to our territories, I ensure I do not travel alone. I do this for my own personal safety, as well as having witnesses with me to prove that I am simply accessing our lands, practicing our cultural duties, and trying to pursue the enjoyment and freedoms that all people should have in so-called Canada. We as Wet'suwet'en people should never be criminalized, targeted, discriminated against for simply being who we are, looking after everything for the betterment of all. We see Canada is vying for a seat on the United Nations Human Rights Council. This should not even be considered until the human rights in Canada are addressed and commitments made are completed. Canada can no longer continue to tell the world that they are a free and democratic country until they prove to the world that they truly are. Messiah, thank you. Now I shall ask on Belissa to address you. Thank you very much, uh, Chief Namox. Uh, President Macaulay, uh, we would like to ask one more minute to finish our remarks, if that's possible. Um, yes, it is possible, but I'll have to grant them extra time to the state as well. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. 
Uh, with all the information described above, we respectfully request the Inter-American Commission, in particular, its reportership on the indigenous people's right to draft a report about the current situation of the indigenous peoples in Canada. Also, we urge the Inter-American Commission that both the indigenous people's rights and human rights defenders reportership monitor the current situation of the Wet'suwet'en nation using all the mechanisms provided by the American Declaration of the Rights and the Duty of the Man. Lastly, we call the Inter-American Commission to call upon the state of Canada to first, stop the violence, surveillance, criminalization against the Wet'suwet'en nation and other lands defenders. Two, cease the construction of the Coast Gas Line Pipeline until freer, pure, and informed consent is obtained from the Wet'suwet'en Nation in accordance with international human rights standards by following the full and adequate discharge of duty of consent. Three, drop the criminal charge against the Wet'suwet'en Nation and other land defenders. Four, prevent and duly investigate the allegation of surveillance, measures, practice of arbitrary detention, in instances of excessive use of force against the last la, against lands defender, and lastly, cease the force eviction of the Wet'suwet'en nation peoples and from their territory. Thank you very much. Uh, as it's very good uh, management of time, Belisa, <laughs> and good to see you again. Um, it's it's um, um, Ambassador Hugh had uh, said it is now your time to make your submissions to the Commission. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair. Uh, colleagues who haven't met me before and, and those who are participating today, my name is Hugh Adset. I'm the Ambassador and Permanent Representative of Canada to the Organization of American States based here in Washington, D.C. Let me start by thanking uh, you for the opportunity to meet with the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights and also with representatives of the Wet'suwet'en Nation and Amnesty International uh, for this public thematic hearing on the topic of the human rights situation of Wet'suwet'en Indigenous peoples in Canada. It's a pleasure to see you, Chair, along with the other commissioners, of course, special rapporteurs and Executive Secretariat staff participating in this hearing. Uh, an honor for me as well uh, to meet with Chief Namox and with Slato Molly Wickham um, from the Wet'suwet'en Nation, and also with Belissa Guerrero, Mary Capron, and Keche Nibia Bande from Amnesty International. Chair, as you know, Canada strongly supports the work of the Commission, and we believe that this institution plays a vital role in the promotion and protection of human rights throughout the hemisphere. Public thematic hearings such as the one that we're having today, serve as a key function in the inter-American human rights system, helping to ensure that voices are heard and perceived human rights challenges are brought to the attention of the Commission, stakeholders in the international community, and to the OAS member states involved, including to assist the latter in addressing any expressed concerns as may be appropriate. And we recognize that Canada, like all countries in the region, faces its own challenges. We are committed to advancing the promotion and protection of human rights of all persons. In particular, Canada recognizes that Indigenous peoples bear the scars of colonial laws and policies imposed on them over decades, if not centuries. The Government of Canada is more committed than ever to working with Indigenous peoples to renew our nation-to-nation -nation relationships and chart a new path forward. The Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, including through its rapporteurship on the human rights of Indigenous peoples also has an important role to play in fostering progress for all Indigenous peoples in Canada and across the Americas. This commitment to the Commission and to the human rights of all Canadians is what motivates our participation in today's hearing. So let me again thank the representatives of the Wet'suwet'en Nation and Amnesty International for sharing their concerns through their submission to the Commission dated April 17th, 2023, as well as through the testimony that we've heard today. And also thank them for inviting the Government of Canada to be part of today's hearing. As the submission reads on page four, and I quote, to learn about the measures needing to be taken to protect and guarantee the human rights of the Wet'suwet'en Nation. Commission itself is to be commended for convening this hearing and providing an opportunity for all parties to be heard in a non-adversarial setting and in a spirit of collaboration and understanding. 
We're currently analyzing the submission that was jointly filed by the Wet'suwet'en Nation and Amnesty International. As the representative of the Government of Canada, I welcome the opportunity to hear the comments made here today, which may provide additional elements and greater context to inform our review. I'm not, however, in a position to address any particular claim or observation. The issues raised in the submission are highly complex, and the Government of Canada is still in the process of consulting the multiple jurisdictions and stakeholders, including the provincial authorities with an interest in these proceedings. My goal in participating here today is primarily to gain a better understanding of the petitioner's concerns and also to provide some general initial context that may help inform the Commission's own analysis. There's also ongoing litigation in Canada in relation to some of the issues raised in the submission. The Government of Canada may provide additional information and context from the official perspective in writing to the Commission in due course. As is rightly pointed out, the Coastal Gas Link Pipeline is a major infrastructure project in the province of British Columbia. It's led by private sector entities and also involves public sector regulatory bodies and multiple stakeholders, including local communities, many of them Indigenous, that are impacted and, in some cases, stand to benefit from the project once completed. The Wet'suwet'en Nation includes a number of communities that are directly impacted by the Coastal Gas Link Pipeline and with which extensive consultations have taken place since the inception of the project. Benefit agreements have been signed with a number of councils representing a significant part of the communities. The project, however, does not enjoy unanimous support. As the Prime Minister of Canada, the Right Honourable Justin Trudeau has said again and again, no relationship is more important to the Government of Canada than its relationship with Indigenous peoples. In fact, Canada has a robust legal framework for the protection of human rights and freedoms. Section 35 of the Constitution Act of 1982 recognizes and affirms the Aboriginal and treaty right of the Aboriginal peoples of Canada. All orders of government, federal, provincial, territorial, municipal, and Indigenous, are obliged to respect Aboriginal and treaty rights and can be held accountable by the courts for failures to respect these rights. Canadian courts have determined that Aboriginal and treaty rights are group and site specific, meaning that different Indigenous groups may have different rights. And every day, the Government of Canada is working to establish and maintain a mutually respectful relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples in Canada in a spirit of reconciliation. Continued genuine engagement is and will remain fundamental if the country is to continue down the path towards reconciliation. In this context, the Government of Canada is working with Indigenous groups across the country, including Wet'suwet'en communities, to explore new ways of working together to advance the recognition of Indigenous rights and self-determination. This includes continuing to work to implement the principle of free, prior, and informed consent. The Government of Canada takes note of the allegations contained in the submission. Let me add a few elements which we believe are important for the Commission to consider. Canada is a free and democratic society with constitutionalism and the rule of law numbering among our foundational principles. Canada values freedom of expression and the right of individuals to peacefully assemble to demonstrate and protest. This strong tradition underlies Canada's legal system, which offers robust protections for the freedoms and rights implicated in social protest. The fundamental freedoms of expression and peaceful assembly are among those guaranteed by Canada's constitution, more specifically in section two of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. The entrenchment of these rights in the Charter ensures that nonviolent social and political protest receives the highest level of protection under the law. These rights are equally protected for everyone in Canada. No government or state actor may limit the exercise of the fundamental freedoms of expression and peaceful assembly unless the limit is prescribed by law and demonstrably justifiable in a free and democratic society. The fundamental freedom of peaceful assembly and freedom of expression are subject to reasonable limits in recognition of the pressing and substantial objectives of protecting the rights of others and preserving peace, public order, and security. It's further been established by Canada's Supreme Court 
that freedom of expression does not extend to acts or threats of violence, nor does it protect the destruction of property, assaults, or other forms of unlawful conduct. Chair, uh, with those remarks, let me thank you for the opportuni opportunity today to provide, uh, in a spirit of constructive dialogue, elements of context that the Commission may find useful as it considers the complex issues uh, raised by the petitioners. And once again, I want to thank the Commission and uh, the petitioner for inviting the Government of Canada to participate in this hearing, which we hope will, all, uh, will allow all parties to gain a better understanding of the issues at hand. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, um, for, um, first of all, being here present and participating as best you can in the circumstances that you've explained. <coughs> um, I still haven't cleared my lungs and throat with my whatever it was I got during the General Assembly. Um, anyway, um, I see you didn't need the extra minutes that you are entitled to. And so, of course, you cannot lay claim to it in the future. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm, as the country rapporteur, it is, it is generally the case that the uh, country rapporteur speaks first. But I find myself as, as uh, an advocate of the common law system, as uh, Canada largely is, um, in some difficulty, um, because in circumstances like this, in our courts of law, um, the court will generally consider uh, a postponement of the proceedings, and certainly a postponement to give the party who is in difficulty in presenting their substantially complete answer. Um, some time to do so. And you have mentioned the possibility of Canada sending um, uh, comments to us in writing, which we always welcome and do welcome and ask that could you please proceed with that course of action. Um, this is a very important matter uh, for the First Peoples of, of Canada in the region of British Columbia and uh, a, a group of them. So, um, and I think it requires complete, full, and considered consideration uh, um, by all of us. Um, and most especially by civil society themselves who have presented their position here today who I'm sure would like to see and, and, and read Canada's response to all the assertions uh, that they have made. And in fact, when one has listened to the assertions, I, again, I mentioned as a practicing lawyer, I really am eager to hear the other side fully. Um, in answer to the assertions made. And, and um, I am sorry, do forgive me. I thought I'd turn this phone down. Um, that's the problem of having two phones or three phones. Um, so uh, I, I do not wish to take up any more time. I want to open the floor to the um, uh, my brother, my sister and brother commissioners, for them to state what their personal position is. As you know, all of you know, we we serve in an in individual capacities, um, but we do discuss, uh, have full dialogue, and try to decide uh, um, in a collegial fashion. Um, I I am um, I've stated my position. And I really am eager to hear the full situation from the state. So I will call now on uh, my sister commissioner Esmeralda to state her position in the matter. <clears throat> uh, 
Gracias, Presidenta. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to greet all of you. I would like to greet the representatives of the state of Canada. As we said before, we know each other quite well. And I also would like to greet the representatives of the indigenous peoples. Uh, I rather not say the name because I don't want to pronounce it in, a, in the wrong way. But after listening to your statements as rapporteur for the rights of indigenous peoples, I would like for you to expand or provide, provide more information on three aspects. Uh, and we would like for the civil society and the state to provide more information on this. The Supreme Court of Justice has recognized the rights of indigenous peoples. But at the same time, there is another decision by the court, probably it's a different court, which prevents indigenous people to go to the places where the pipeline is being built. So I would like to know how this is legally possible because on the one side, we have a court that is recognizing the rights of indigenous peoples. And at the same time, and on the other side, there is another court that is denying their rights and is preventing indigenous peoples from visiting the site. And this is related to the second aspect. Criminal law is being used to persecute land defenders and those who advocate for the territory, those who advocate for indigenous law that, re that is recognized by the state of Canada. So that is also contradictory because those who are defending the land are being criminalized. And it is likely that by the end of the year, um, these people may be incarcerated because of these facts. And thirdly, uh, I would like to highlight what the ambassador has just highlighted. As rapporteur for the rights of indigenous people, I would like to be able to coordinate and establish a dialogue so that we can identify the limitations faced by indigenous peoples. since prior consultation is not being respected. And this is a key element for construction projects. Uh, Chief Namox has indicated that hereditary chiefs oppose the project and that they have never been heard. So I'd like to see if somehow the Inter-American Commission and my rapporteurship could be a means or a bridge to guarantee communication between the parties so that we can assess some of the aspects. Um, as the ambassador was saying, the need to know more about the situation and to find solutions. Thank you, Madam President. Um, thank you, my sister Esmeralda. Very good points um, from the rapporteur on indigenous people. Thanks for your intervention. Um, I now invite my brother commissioner, Joel Hernandez, to state his position. Thank you very much. Madam President, I would like to respectfully greet the representatives of the civil society and Ambassador Adset. 
and I would like to thank you both for uh, being here. I believe this is a very important hearing and I'm glad it's taking place. First of all, because generally, one of the criticisms made to the commission is that it doesn't have a real, a really inter-American vision because there's a group of countries that don't usually go to, or maybe are not invited to these spaces to discuss human rights issues. And as Ambassador Atset said, these are not adversarial spaces. These are not contentious spaces. No uh, international responsibilities are placed. We, these are spaces for dialogue, which are very useful so that the commission is aware about the human rights situation of a country, but it's also useful to establish communication sources as uh, Commissioner Arosemena just mentioned or proposed. Also, I think it's very important because this goes to show something we constantly see in our work. All countries face human rights challenges. And what always, but it's so interesting for me is that cooperation, state cooperation is very important. Uh, regardless of the issue or the challenges of the or the participation of countries in these spaces is very much appreciated and acknowledged. In particular, when we in hearings we have state officials who can give answers to many of the questions posed here, for example, at this hearing where uh, very specific questions have been asked. I appreciate Ambassador Adset's offer to send additional information on this issue, which I recognize is quite complex. So what, what I would like to ask Ambassador Adset is that I would like it if in his answer, he could share with the commission, what are the legal protections in Canada for the principle of prior free and informed consultation for indigenous peoples. We've already heard that Canada has not undersigned the American Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And I took a quick look at the on of the, the, the website of the International Labour Organization and Canada has not undersigned Agreement 169, which is a robust principle in, our, in, in the international community, the issue of prior consultation for the realization of projects that affect indigenous peoples. So I think that uh, the thing here is the lack of this consultation. So it would be very useful that for the commission to know how that principle is incorporated to Canadian law. Thank you very much. Very much, my brother. Well, and I now call on my brother, Carlos Bonal, commissioner, to state his position. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam President, for the opportunity to, uh, to say something in this hearing. I would like to uh, express my gratitude to the petitioners and also to Mr. Ambassador for being here in this, in this hearing. I have to confess that I, I feel, you know, he, listening to what has brought to our attention, I, I have to, con to confess that I feel on the one hand, deeply concerned and also disappointed in this hearing. First, deeply concerned because of the caliber and the intensity of the allegations of violations of human rights and also uh, charter rights, because I know, I know the Canadian Charter of Human Rights and know the standards and some of the, uh, the, of the allegations here concerning detention, uh, harassment by the police, uh, surveillance, uh, uh, to, from my uh, humble point of view and uh, without, uh, of course, without considering the appropriate evidence, 
they violate even the Oaks standard of proportionality that the Supreme Court of Canada has set for the charter rights. So I, I am deeply concerned about this case. On the other hand, it is, uh, and I have to say this honestly, it is disappointing that the state did not prepare a full response to the allegation because no one is questioning that Canada in general has a, has a constitutional democratic framework. The point is not that this hearing is about whether the allegations uh, are true or not, where the state has a response, where there is justification for the behavior of the police, and also where there has been a respect or violation to the uh, rights of, indi of the indigenous community in this specific case, in this specific case, and due to, the, to this uh, infrastructure project. So I am. I would like to, to read uh, the, um, the report sent by the state, also for the sake of due process in the dialogue. I, I would request my fellow commissioners to, to um, give the report to the petitioners and to grant them the right to reply, uh, which is the, the fair trial in this, in this case, uh, the, uh, an exercise of a of fair trial in this case. And, um, and also to take seriously what uh, my fellow commissioner Hernandez said before is that I don't have clarity concerning whether Canada actually respects the, the right to a consultation, to prior consultation. And in that case, what are the rules that apply? And uh, uh, not only indigenous communities, but also investors and people who are willing to undertake infrastructure projects, they need to have certainty about what are the rules that are applied and that actually enforce and make and render concrete this right to prior consultation uh, that belong to every indigenous community in the, in the world, or that should be low. And of course, I know that Canada is not a party of the, of the convention. Canada is not a party of the uh, ILO um, 169 convention. However, however, what this shows is that Canada is below the standards, is below the standards of, uh, if we compare that to all of the countries in the region. So this is my, my, uh, my honest reply and my honest point of view concerning this hearing. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, my brother. One thing which has sort of come clear for the commissioner's statements is that each and every one of them uh, uh, would like to hear from the state and have a copy of the state. And my brother, um, um, Commissioner Carlos, it goes without saying that the uh, civil society would have a copy of, of um, Canada, the respondent state's um, position in this matter. And they would have an opportunity to reply to it. And of course, the state would also have a like right to their reply. But I now um, invite the executive secretary um, uh, Tanya, if you wish to say something. Thank you, Madam President. And, and, and Tanya, Tanya, before you start, if you can, if, if you consider any procedural step um, which we could use in order to advance this uh, continuing dialogue, uh, albeit from the state in writing, um, so that we can come to a full and fulsome information and on the receipt of information and understanding of the state's position and you, the civil society. Thank you. Go on. Thank you, Thank you Madam President. And I greet Ambassador Hugh Gatset and uh, all the members of Amnesty International and also of uh, the indigenous communities. Um, I will defer my participation or my questions to uh, the Redesca, uh, reporter, but I will suggest to send an Article 18 letter in order to have more information uh, up, apart from the information that um, the requesters of this hearing offer to us. We can uh, provide an Article 18 letter to the state uh, with uh, concrete with more and focused questions, in-depth questions. That's right, Madam President. That's the proposal that I may suggest. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Maria Claudio, anything? No? Um, 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 uh, oh, uh, um, Soledad, where's Soledad? Oh, there you are. Here I am, Madam President. 
um, I'm as concerned as uh, the commissioners. I would like to greet the uh, civil society and the state of Canada. I would like to say that on the uh, report from 2022, our report on uh, ESEA rights, we specifically focused on this issue and expressed our concern for the lack of prior consent by the leaders of the Wet'suwet'en uh, community and how this project would be uh, uh, would be built around one of the uh, last sources of drinking water in the territory. So we use that for our analysis on business and human rights in Canada. And I would like to ask, in which way are you considering the inter-American and international standards on businesses and human rights within the framework of this situation? Of course, we are at your disposal so that you can take them into consideration. And I would also like to ask the state and the civil society if there's there has been an, a, an evaluation of the social and the environmental impact of the construction of the pipeline. And if these standards on businesses and human rights have been taken into account and how you are taking into account the impact of the pipeline on the um, greenhouse effect uh, gas uh, greenhouse effect gases in Canada we know that the uh, indigenous peoples have a fundamental role to play in terms of climate change so I would like to hear reflections from both parties on this issue thank you very much um th thank you I I have to say with uh, a bit red in the face that we've exceeded our time the commission the only only party to do so today but I I do I am aware that we have special rapporteur Vaca do you wish some time special rapporteur no now that is unusual for you thank you very much <laughs> thank you very much I now um, ca I'll call upon the states. I wouldn't add anything to what I say. I just live in expectation of what has been promised and and what we will do. So I now invite the state, um, this um, civil society, to make their comments, um, additional comments as they wish. Uh, Twelve minutes, I believe. Madam President, uh, Sleiro and Chief Namo will address most of the questions right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief. Uh, um, and who? Sleiro. Sleiro. Okay. So please go ahead. Yes. Please go ahead, whoever is speaking first. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to uh, start off just by following up on a number of things that Canada had said. You know, they said it was a largest private investment in the history of Canada. And yet these are countries that actually have some of the worst human rights uh, violations on the planet. We're talking about Malaysia. We're talking about Korea. We're talking about China and Japan, you know, and uh, I don't consider that private sector investment at all. You know, and he talked about the consultation process. Well, if you're not talking to the right people, uh, why would you call it consultation? You know, I myself have spoken at the United Nations three times, twice in New York and once in Geneva. Oh, well, Chief was frozen. And in that... Please continue, Chief. Yeah, I just wanted to remind everybody that we are a nation. We're not a community. You know, he's spoke of uh, communities that signed on. Well, they don't have the proper right to be consulted. You know, it is a nation, it is the Wet'suwet'en. You know, the bands, the reserve system was created to remove our people from the land. Because we, you're gonna be the path of least resistance. They're funded by Canada, so they will agree. And he talked about the rule of law, a little bit about the law. You know, ignorance is not 
a way to defend yourself in a court of law. You can't ignore the truth. You know, and that is exactly what Canada is doing. We talk to them. We tell them why we we do what we are. And we're not protesting. We're protecting. You talked about the environment. You talked about climate change. We're at the front lines of this. And look at how we're treated. Look how our women are treated. Look at how our future generations are treated. We're doing the right thing at the right time, which is fighting for this entire planet. And yet we're criminalized, removed from our lands, put in jail. You know, where are these rights that Canada talks about when our people are incarcerated at the rates they are? You know, when we talk about how and why we do what we do, it's not complex at all. It is very simple. It is the simple of the land. It is what this planet needs. Our laws follow what the earth needs. We don't tell the earth what to do. This planet will do fine without us. It is us that is damaging it. And this is why we step forward and put ourselves at the forefront of this. And this is why Canada is trying so hard to ignore us. We talk to the world because Canada won't listen. You know, when we talk about respect in our language, it's called Wagus. The earth needs the respect she deserves, and we're showing it to her. And yet it is our people that are losing all sense of wanting and knowing that we belong to the land. We that land does not, we never said our land ever, like in a private sentence or in any way, that land is there to be protected by us, the very first peoples of the land. That is our law. That is our duty. And that is what we're doing. And yet, because of financial institutions, corporations, um, the human rights of this country are going downhill. I, I don't understand how a so-called democracy can be run by an industry and finances. That is not democracy in my mind. I'm a very humble person, but I will say that very blatantly, that this country is losing its democracy, its freedoms, its rights, its humanity. We often say that money doesn't have a conscience. It doesn't have a heart. And Canada is proving it to the Wet'suwet'en and all Indigenous people of this country by continuing to do what they do. I would like to pass, pass it on to Slato, if I could, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief. Yes, please go on, sir. Okay. Thank you so much for all of your comments. I really appreciate the opportunity to respond. And I'd like to respond to a couple of the comments specifically about um, you know, the discrepancy between the Supreme Court decision that recognized um, Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs as the title holders, that we have never extinguished our title, that we have never signed treaties on our territory. Um, and that's a 1997 Supreme Court of Canada decision that was made. Um, shortly after that, um, it's through Freedom of Information, we found out that um, Canada and the province and other um, state uh, arms of the state were meeting to discuss how to deal with the fact that we, we did um, receive you know, recognition of our title and how to repress uh, the Wet'suwet'en people. And so the injunction that was given, I just wanna give a bit of background on the injunction um, that was given by Justice Church in a lower court than the Supreme Court Delgamuth Gesteewe decision. Um, and during this, um, the injunction was brought against two individuals. Most of the clans and the Wet'suwet'en nation and the hereditary chiefs did not have an opportunity to be involved in that injunction hearing, which again is in a lower court, a provincial court. Um, but the test for um, a company like CGL getting an injunction is very low. All they have to do is prove irreparable harm. There's a balance of convenience. And this doesn't take into account Indigenous rights or human rights. In fact, Justice Church replied to the court um, in the hearing that this was not a place for those types of arguments and that they should be brought in a trial. It has been since 2018 and Coastal GasLink has not brought this issue to trial. They simply brought the injunction so that they could criminalize anyone who tried to stop the construction of the pipeline. And we have not seen a trial for the injunction. And 
Um, this is a huge concern because injunctions are being used this way against Indigenous people to, to repress our rights, um, to dehumanize us um, all over the province of British Columbia and Canada. Um, this is becoming a very grave concern to all of us. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about this, um, you know, the democratic country. And as Namox had mentioned, uh, the freedom of expression that we can protest, um, but we are not protesters. We are Wet'suwet'en people. Um, we have our own valid and recognized laws, even recognized um, our body of laws in the Delgamuk Kistewe court case was recognized by the Supreme Court of Canada um, that our hereditary clan system was complex and that we have laws in order to uh, manage our lands in order to manage our people and that we have trespass laws. We have laws against trespass into our territories. We also have specific and unique rights as indigenous people, even within Canada's own laws in international laws. So we cannot be lumped in to um, you know, protesters as if we were any other Canadian citizen acting under Canada. Um, further to that, you know, the RCMP actions um, and reports, there have been reports by the Canadian Review and Complaints Commission, which we made a submission to in 2021 because there were arbitrary exclusion zones that were preventing Wet'suwet'en people from their territory, preventing us from our homes, preventing our hereditary chiefs from accessing their territory. Um, and in that request, uh, they referred to the case in El Sabuktuk on the East Coast um, that happens, happened several years before that. Also, again, Indigenous people that were fighting to protect their lands against fracked gas. Um, and in that report, they said um, that the police were acting in very racist ways. Um, and when we, using excessive force, that this issue should be dealt with on a political level. And... Um, one of the responses was that, well, we don't need to do an investigation into the RCMP because we already know all of the ways they are behaving and in racist ways and violating human rights and violating charter rights and violating Indigenous rights. So we already made recommendations to them. None of those recommendations have been implemented. Um, they have proven to be a danger to Indigenous women. The police and private security are a danger to Indigenous women. Um, there are multiple, multiple billions of dollars in class action lawsuits against the police in Canada for their racist and sexualized violence against Indigenous women. I've had officers, and this is all <clears throat> documented and recorded, saying when the raids are happening, I want Molly. They are specifically targeting me and coming after me. When I was arrested in 2021 and we were driven in the back of a police car down the road past our village site, the officer said to me, said to us, three women, Indigenous women in the back of the police car, take a good look, ladies. This is the last time you're ever going to see it. But we didn't know what that meant. Is this the last time we're ever going to be on our territory? Are they going to burn our village site down again? Um, those are the kinds of behaviors that the police are um, are bringing to our territory. Those are that's the racism. They compared us to orcs from Lord of the Rings um, during the arrests. And Canada has a crisis of Indigenous people, especially Indigenous women. We are overrepresented in prisons in Canada by you know in fifty percent of Indigenous women are filling up our jail cells, and we cannot deal with Canada down the barrel of a gun. We have been trying for years, for years, we have been trying to negotiate. Our hereditary chiefs have worked tirelessly. Um, there is no reason that there, this should not have a full response because this is not news to them. We have requested meetings with Trudeau. We have requested meetings with all levels of government on an ongoing basis. And frankly, we cannot negotiate looking down the barrel of a gun when we are constantly under threat of violence. Um, luckily to date, we had nobody's been murdered on our territory, but the, we never know when that's gonna happen. And so we need real action to be taken. And I thank you so much for the time, Alexa.
Thank you so much um, for that submission. I, I now um, hand over the floor to um, uh, Your Excellency, Ambassador Hastet, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chair. And let me again thank the Commission and also the other participants uh, for the opportunity to be here this afternoon and to participate in the discussion. Uh, I've taken a lot of notes uh, during the course of the conversation, including taking note of some of the specific questions that were raised uh, for, for potential uh, follow-up, the question related to uh, free prior and informed consent, uh, for example, um, and uh, a number of other questions as well, including questions uh, specifically related to business and human rights as well. Chair, uh, I also took good note of your request and the request from some of the other commissioners as well. Uh, that uh, we provide, uh, if we can, some additional information in relation to this and to other matters. Uh, so what I will do is I will, uh, of course, uh, uh, consult and see what additional information uh, we might be able to provide. And let me once again thank you for the opportunity to uh, to be here today um, to listen carefully uh, to the comments that were made, to note the questions that were raised as well, uh, and for the ability to participate in this discussion. Thank you. Uh, Maria for <laughs> points because it was on and I turned it off. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. It's for me now to close this hearing. Uh, um, but before I do so, I just want to make a comment um, uh, based on what Sado uh, said and um, uh, part of your re reply just now. Uh, please re remember that um, I was a rapporteur on the rights of indigenous people as um, Commissioner Esmeralda, first vice president, has put on the floor that the commission, she and, and the rest of the commissioners can play the part of mediator in, in a dialogue discourse between the, yourselves and the state. That is one mechanism which is open um, uh, to the floor. And then, um, the secretary, um, our um, executive secretary mentioned are uh, sending an article 18 letter to the state in which we will ask specific questions of the state. But this is not uh, um, uh, uh, other than, in, it's in addition to the state's uh, um, intent to send a written uh, statement to us, which will of course uh, share with the with you all in civil society. Well, I just wanted to, to um, add to our request, this um, thing is because uh, I am a little bit puzzled. As a common law lawyer, I'm puzzled. Uh, and I asked the state, are there no laws in British Columbia to protect the right of persons, citizens, uh, groups of people, tribal peoples, uh, 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 um, to protect their properties, both real and personal, in British Columbia. Um, because I, 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 my, my, I believe that we all have the right to protect our properties. And a, a question for civil society. Did you appeal from this in grant of the injunction by the lower court, the latter injunction by the lower court, um, which was uh, uh, granted by justice, whatever his name is, uh, um, or is there no cause of appeal from that court when it grants uh, injunctions? Um, because if that is so, that would be a failure of the access to justice. Uh, um, in within that state, um, so if and perhaps perhaps Ambassador, you, you you can direct if if the state can direct its mind to that because I find it rather puzzling that that injunction seems to have been left to stand. Um, and remember, I I I'm saying this, Ambassador, as this is not a litigious matter. 
that civil society can always ask um, the, from the commission assistance in the technical fashion on how to move forward in any particular matter or problem. So, and this is also open to the state of Canada. So that is open to both sides. And we really would love to resolve this matter by moving forward so that neither side would feel aggrieved about rights being violated or rights being claimed by one side, which this that side doesn't consider as appropriate. But we ought to have true dialogue in this matter. And so we look forward to having more facts on um, which we could chew and consider the matter, all of us. And with that, I thank all of you for being here. And, and I thank um, Ambassador Azlet for being here on his own uh, and, and fighting the good fight on behalf of his state. And thank you, civil society, as usual. You present a very strong and clear case, but there are things that you could also add and expand upon. So I thank you very, very much. And I thank all those who are online and have listened to this hearing. And we hope to resolve this matter one way or the other before Esmeralda and I are any, any much older and hopefully before the end of this year, before the 31st of December, definitely. So thank you very much, all of you. Thank Goodbye. you, thank you. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Commissioner, we have the, the picture. Yes, Chief, yes, Chief. Yes, Chief? <laughs> Just to have a picture together. Picture. Yeah. Oh, gosh, yes. yes. You reminded yes, me. Please. You see, I tell you, I, I'm always thinking of other things. <laughs> you did. You did. <laughs> okay, so if everyone can uh, turn on their cameras and uh, like uh, and look to the camera, just be okay. Just another one, please. There we go. Thank you so much to all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.